Welcome to lesson number four. In this lesson, we are going to talk about roles and responsibilities within the payment card industry. Now, if you are new to the industry, this topic, it is kind of crucial for you because it is important to have a solid understanding on who is responsible for doing what and when is actually uh, possible to have an exception for those uh, roles or responsibilities because it might happen sometimes in the case of the ISAs and QSAs, but you will learn uh, that later here. So welcome to this lesson and let's uh, let's get into it. Roles and responsibilities that we are going to review in this uh, lesson are the Internal Security Assessor or ISA, the Qualified Security Assessor or QSA, Merchants and Service Providers, the acquirer's responsibilities, the responsibilities for the PCI Council, the Payment Card Industry Security Standards Council. We will review that as well. And also the payment brands. What, what are the responsibilities for the payment brands? If we have a data breach involving card holder data, what's the responsibility in that particular case of the payment brands? We will get into that. First, we are going to start with the ISA or Internal Security Assessor. So let's begin by talking about who is the ISA? What is this role about? Well, the ISA, it is the internal resource for an organization. It is a subject matter expert who will normally lead the engagement or the assessment regarding PCI compliance from an internal perspective. This person is going to gather all of the evidence. It is going to train the teams um, this would be the main point of contact for all of the activities regarding PCI compliance, not only during the assessment, but also through the year, making sure that uh, compliance with PCI is an ongoing process. So let's review some of the main um, responsibilities for the ISA. First, this person it is going to gather evidence and coordinate um, the preparedness assess um, uh, the preparedness for the PCI assessment. So as I mentioned before, this person is not going to be uh, or helping the, the organization to be ready just for the assessment. This person or this uh, role, this internal resource for the organization, it is going to have a critical and crucial role throughout the year. Because throughout the year, that person is going to make sure that that organization it is meeting all of the different requirements for PCI. Let's say, for example, there is one particular requirement um, regarding vulnerabilities assessments. Um, one organization needs to have, let's say, for example, a merchant one level needs to have four um, quarterly vulnerability scans um, that needs to report at the time of the assessment. Now it is, in this case, it is the responsibility of the ISA to make sure that the organization, it is performing those quarterly vulnerability scans. So that's one example right there. Review policies and procedures and ensure compliance with the PCI DSS. Now this um, resource, this role most likely is, it is not going to be creating the policies and procedures per se, but it is going to be reviewing a lot of documents, making sure that those uh, documents that are being created align with the requirements as per PCI. So this person would spend a lot of time reading internal documents, internal policies and procedures. And if uh, it doesn't uh, comply with the, or it doesn't meet the, the intent of the PCI requirements, this is the person or this is the role who would say we need to change this, we need to add this in order to be PCI compliant. Validate the scope of the assessment. Now, as I mentioned before, this person, this role, it is the subject matter expert regarding PCI compliance. So this person, it is going to go to the PCI Security Standards Council. It is going to find the uh, document regarding uh, guidance on scoping and segmentation and will be the leader on the PCI scoping exercise before the QSA or the external assessor comes into the organization 
and starts running the annual assessment. And I say before because um, there is, this is a very um, critical activity. It is very, uh, I would say, time consuming for the assessment. And if that organization has the uh, has this resource, this internal role, it is the responsibility of the ISA to make sure that the scope for the assessment it is accurate, that whatever it needs to be included in that uh, scope, it is actually included, and that the CDE is properly defined. And there is guidance. That person it doesn't need to invent anything. There is guidance from the PCI Security Standards Council on how to perform um, the scoping exercise. Point of contact between the QSA and the organization at the time of the assessment. So as I said before, this is the subject matter expert regarding PCI compliance. So this person, it is going to lead the assessment from an internal perspective, and it is going to be working with all of the different departments asking for uh, the pieces of evidence that it needs to be submitted to the QSA firm in order to uh, complete the annual PCI assessment. Uh, now, on the other hand, if uh, that organization don't have a QSA or for the particular assessment, there is no QSA present, well, the ISA, the Internal Security Assessor, it is the um, party performing the assessment. This also depends on the requirements from the acquirer. The acquirer might say, uh, I don't need you to have a QSA firm doing this assessment for you. In, in the case of the um, self-assessment questionnaires, if they uh, need to report compliance with a self-assessment questionnaire, most likely they are not going to need a QSA. Uh, and in that case would be the internal security assessor or ISA performing the PCI DSS assessment. Support and guidance during the assessment. This is most, um, I would say this is mostly when we have a QSA firm doing the assessment for us. We kind of are that leader telling our people, telling our uh, internal uh, different departments what to do, what we need to provide, how to work with the QSA. This would be the point on, of contact, as we said before, uh, next point, subject matter, uh, matter, matter expert regarding PCI compliance. Of course, this person, it is responsible in making sure that we are compliant with PCI. This is the person that senior leadership it is going to talk about regarding PCI compliance. This um, resource or this role will keep, um, keep an eye on every uh, single time that the PCI Security Standards Council releases a new update either in the standards, in the procedures, um, or in some cases in the reporting documentation. For example, let's say this last year we used a self-assessment self questionnaire um, A, let's say, for example. But for this year, uh, that self same self-assessment questionnaire is completely different. Uh, I'm, I'm going extreme here, <laughs> um, but it might be the case that something changes. So this role, this person, it is responsible for uh, keeping an eye on all of the different uh, updates from the PCI Security Standards Council, making sure that our company or the organization keeps being compliant with PCI. And also uh, in the next step, um, the next um, point we have here, support in the selection of samples for the assessment. So let's say we, we, have, we are a large organization. We have hundreds and thousands of systems, hundreds and thousands of workstations, servers, etc. Um, the internal security assessor, it is going to, if there is a QSA, it is going to probably um, not be the one selecting the samples. That would be the role of the QSA. But if we don't have a QSA for the assessment, it is the ISA doing the assessment. So this um, person, this assessor, would we'll select a sample between those 5,000 servers, for example, would we'll select a sample that it is an accurate representation of, of all of the different systems uh, within the environment. Review and evaluate compensating controls. Now, if the internal security assessor, ISA, it is running the assessment for uh, the organization, um, sometimes, 
not usual, but sometimes we find um, cases where that organization cannot meet a specific requirement. In those cases, um, it has to exist or we need to create a compensating control. Uh, now, a compensating control, it is for those particular cases where the organization for either um, technical reasons or because it doesn't have the um, sufficient amount of personnel uh, cannot meet the requirement. It's not like the organization can say, well, I don't like that requirement. I'm not going to be compliant with it. I don't, I'm, I'm not going to implement it. No, it needs to be a, a business justification for it. It has to be something in written. We need to document it and we create what, what is called a compensating control uh, that will meet the intent of the original requirement or beyond. So we need to be careful with this in this um, case that if we created one, two, or um, a name of um, a number of compensating controls would be the internal security assessor or ISA who would review those uh, compensating controls. If we have a QSA doing the assessment for us, would be the QSA uh, who would review those compensating controls for us. Now just remember, a compensating control, it is for those cases where the organization definitely cannot meet um, the PCI requirement. But still, uh, the compensating control, it needs to meet the intent, the original intent of that particular requirement. And we need to have a business justification of why that uh, particular requirement cannot be uh, uh, met. And last of our list here is ensuring that PCI compliance, it is an ongoing process. It is an ongoing process throughout the year. Uh, and this is very important because we don't, we don't want to have an organization that only is PCI compliant at the time of the assessment that is just not secure. That is not what the PCI security standards uh, council <laughs> recommends actually is the other way. And I mean, that's just not secure. It is not the intent of this standard. It should be an ongoing process throughout the year. And that's one of the responsibilities of the internal security assessor, making sure that those requirements that we are marking as in place at the time of the assessment are in place, not only at the time of the assessment, but throughout the whole year. We are not complying just at the time of the assessment. We are complying year round. Now let's talk about the qualified security assessor or QSA. That's me. This is my current uh, role. <laughs> I'm a senior cybersecurity consultant, um, but most of the times I work in as a QSA running PCI assessments. As you can already tell, some of the uh, responsibilities for the QSA are similar as those from uh, for the uh, ISA, the Internal Security Assessor. First, we are going to validate the scope of the assessment. One more time, I would recommend you to go to the PCI Security Standards Council website and look for that, uh, look for that document regarding um, a scope guidance. And this is actually the first step that we normally do um, in in the PCI DSS assessment. We want to make sure that all of the different systems, controls, uh, all of the different items that we need to have uh, included in the assessment are actually included. Uh, we will also be checking um, some um, network diagrams, car, uh, car data, carholder data flow diagrams. So those diagrams are going to be the point of discussion for that first scoping meeting. And then we will go to perform the PCI DSS assessment. There is a lot of um, P uh, QSA companies out there. Every company might have a different process, procedure, but no matter how you do it, at the end of the day, the uh, standard is one, and we are going to be assessing against the same standard. Um, we as QSAs need to validate all of the evidence provided by merchants, policies, procedures, diagrams, as I said before, and the network diagram. That's one of the first steps. 
cardholder data flow diagrams, if they have any. Uh, perform testing procedures as indicated in the PCI DSS. This is important because some QSAs come from a software development background, for example. Some QSAs come from a penetration testing background. So sometimes, and you might see this, maybe you don't. Sometimes if a QSA comes from a penetration testing background, that person might want to be more um, technical at the time of assessing um, requirement 11, for example. If you are a QSA, you have a penetration testing background, you will be very comfortable at the time of assessing requirement 11, which includes um, the methodology for penetration testing. Now, my recommendation, if you are, um, if you were a penetration, uh, a pen tester before, and now you're a QSA, it is nice to, to have that background, but remember this is a very complex um, assessment. It is very stressful um, for the entity being assessed. Just um, be within the standards. Sometimes people want to go beyond and kind of uh, cover or address other things that are not in the standard. That's not what we should do. We should stay within uh, what the standard says. Uh, and again, it is nice to have all of those different backgrounds from pen testing, software development, whatever the case it is. But just remember, please stay within the DSS. This is a very complex uh, standard. And if we want to make it even more complicated, um, probably that's not going to be good for you and for the entity being assessed. And also, it is a bad practice. That's not what the PCI Security Standards Council recommends. We should do what we need to do. No more, no less. And that's exactly what the next um, point here in our list is. Adhere to the PCI TSS requirements and assessment procedures. If the PCI Security Standard uh, Council uh, or the DSS says, review this, do that, um, just make sure you, you do that. Don't go beyond because you can, you can get into something completely different and, and that's not the intent for this um, standard. Select samples of business facilities and system components when employing sampling. Now, uh, if you go to the PCI Security Standards Council, you are going to find documentation regarding uh, the proper way of uh, employing sampling. Actually, at the beginning of the DSS, there is some guidance on how to properly do uh, sampling. Sampling is very useful for QSAs because um, the same way that I describe it for the ISA, sometimes we have organizations with hundreds and or thousands of different servers. Um, probably it's a global organization with facilities here, facilities in four other continents. We are not going to go to each single facility. We just need to make sure we have a sample that it is an accurate representation of most of the environment, at least 90%. So that's where uh, sampling, uh, it is very crucial for us as assessors. If you are an internal assessor, an ISA, um, you might find this very helpful because sometimes uh, companies do not need to have necessarily a QSA. So that, going to, that is going to be your responsibility. Now, I, I sometimes, or most of the times that since I started talking in this uh, lesson, I refer to ISS QSAs, but it might be the case that you are just preparing for an exam or you are preparing for a job interview. This still is crucial, is critical, and is great information for you to know and understand because having kind of a clear idea on the different roles and respons responsibilities, if you are working already with, within the payment card industry, it will make everything easier for you. Next uh, topic here in our list, evaluate compensating controls. Similar to the ISA, it's exactly the same. Uh, we are going to make sure that those compensating controls um, are there or they are using that compensating control because definitely there is a business justification. They cannot 
meet uh, the requirement and the compensating control that they decided to use it is meeting the intent of the original requirement and last in our list regarding um, the responsibilities for the qualified security assessor is deliver the report and a report on compliance uh, an attestation of compliance if we are doing uh, or helping an organization with a self-assessment questionnaire that will be the deliverable in this case now in the rock <laughs> the report on compliance um this we're we going to have a full uh, lesson regarding this because it is a very extensive uh, document it's a very comprehensive document and sometimes it gets very confusing so we will talk about it later in this course okay now let's talk about merchants and service providers responsibilities for merchants and service providers first if we are storing cardholder data we know we need to protect it right so that's the first thing they need to apply the physical and logical logical controls to protect cardholder data now something um, that i want to add here if you do not need to store cardholder data in order to continue with your um, operations just don't do it that is going to reduce your scope significantly and it's going to save you a lot of money probably not just you if you're an isa qsa or internal resource for your organization um, but for uh, your company the, this means saving a lot of money a lot of time a lot of effort please do not do it if you don't need it review and understand the payment card industry security standards uh, this is kind of um, basic if we are storing cardholder data we know we need to be compliant with the payment card industry we at least need to know what the payment card industry is what is the standard that the payment card industry have and how can we implement it is that something that we need to and so on so basic understanding for merchants and service providers it is kind of the first step understand the validation and reporting requirements of each payment brand so remember in our pre one of our previous uh, lessons we were discussing that each payment brand has different reporting requirements it is the merchant's responsibility to understand what those requirements are for each payment brand so the payment brand is not going to come to you and tell you look this is what you need to do step by step i want you to do it here maybe your acquirer will give you guidance on how to do it and what you need to do but also it is your responsibility because um at the end of the day you are uh, the merchant it is the entity that might be get fines if things are not handled uh, the proper way now if you are a merchant you know that you need to report compliance um, with pci you might probably report it with a report on compliance or a self-assessment questionnaire maybe a prioritized approach tool who knows well the entity that knows it is your acquirer or the acquirer of the merchant the acquirer um, it is going to tell the merchant what the reporting requirements are if they want to receive a report on compliance with the attestation of compliance uh, or a self-assessment questionnaire with an attestation of compliance so at the end of the day it is the acquirer who says what the reporting um, in the validation requirements are for the merchant and one more time ensure that pci compliance it is an ongoing process year round this is not once a year one two months a year no from january uh, 1st to december 31st we need to make sure that our organization in this case for merchants and service providers are pci compliant now let's talk about acquirers normally is the bank is the is a financial institution who would tell you who would tell the merchants 
um, couple of interesting, uh, interesting things. So let's see. First, it is going to specify to its merchants when and how to report PCI compliance. Uh, as we discussed before, the acquirer will tell the merchant, you are processing uh, this amount of transactions per year. So based on that, you need to report compliance to me, the acquirer, uh, with a self-assessment questionnaire, or if you're a level one merchant, you're processing for, let's say, be some 8 million transactions per year. So you're a merchant level one, you need to report to me, the, your acquirer, with uh, a report on compliance and the attestation of compliance. So the acquirer, it is the entity who says that to the merchant. Determine merchant levels and reporting process. Um, I just said that based on the volume of transactions and based on the requirements of each payment brand, the acquirer, it is going to tell the merchant what the level is and how they need to report uh, compliance and validate compliance. The acquirer also, it is going to either accept or deny merchant compensating controls. They are going to review the compensating controls in case that and I say you, the merchant, <laughs> in case that the merchant is um, for particular technical, logical, whatever the case is, cannot meet the intent of the requirement and it has already a business justification, it isn't written and the compensating control was created, the acquirer might be very interesting, uh, very interested in this because um, at the end of the day, they are the, or the acquirer, it is the entity that either it is going to as accept it or deny it. And final, understand each payment brand's compliance validation programs. So the, we already talked a little bit about this. We already have a lesson, um, one of our previous lessons is about this. Uh, it is the responsibility of the acquirer to understand each one uh, of the payment brands internal validation programs are very different for each payment brand and the acquirer needs to understand each all of those each one of uh, those programs because at the end of the day the acquirer will tell the merchant how to do and what to do regarding uh, based on the volume of transactions for each payment brand and now let's talk about the payment card industry security standards council pci ssc first responsibility of the payment card industry security standards council is to promote payment card security um, around the world these are just a couple of the main um, responsibilities that i was um, that i remember and that i um, if you go to the PCA uh, Council website, this is, this is a couple of the main uh, ones. There might be a little bit more, but this is kind of the main ones. First, the PCI Council is going to promote the payment card security around the world. There is a lot of conferences, uh, seminars, there is training, um, a lot of interesting things. The PCI uh, Council maintains the PCI DSS, the Payment Card Industry Data Security Standard, the payment application data security standard and there's a couple more you can go to the website and have some time looking at those different uh, standards for this course our main focus uh, payment card industry data security standard pci dss training certification and up-to-date list of qsas pa qsas isas Payment card industry professionals or PCIPs and approved scanning vendors or ASBs. So if you go to the uh, PCI Council website, you are going to find a list of all of these professionals where you can validate either they are um, actually um, listed there. It means they are they are allowed. Uh, in the case of the QSA, they are allowed to run a PCI DSS assessment, if they are an ISA, same thing. If they are if they are a payment card industry professional, PCIP might mean that that person has um, 
went through the training, has the knowledge, can be a very useful internal resource. In the case of the ASBs, approved scanning vendors, they are approved per the PCI Council to do uh, quarterly vulnerability scans for your organization. Uh, the next point in our list, maintain a list of approved QSA companies and AS, uh, approved scanning vendor companies. For the ASBs, Qualys, Tenable Nessus, Rapid7, uh, there is a couple. There is a lot of providers out there. You can do some research if you're um, interested in learning more about that. Next, uh, the PCI Council also man maintains a list of validated payment applications, solutions, devices. This is uh, important when you are doing an assessment. Um, in one of the requirements, you are required to provide a list of the solutions that you are using for receiving um, car present transactions. Um, those P2P solutions, for example, you need to have a list. Where are they located? Model and serial number. And the PCI Council maintains a list of all of the different approved solutions for receiving and processing um, payments. Last responsibility of the PCI Council of our list is uh, the creation and maintenance of documentation used by PCI professionals, um, QSAs, ISAs, PCIPs, ASBs, etc. And not just the professionals, but anyone working in, with um, the payment card industry. Normally, um, it is the responsibility if you are working for your company as an ISA or as an internal resource to make sure that you are providing um, updated uh, documentation. You don't want to assess your entity, for example, with the standard that it was, that it is not used anymore. So it is your responsibility to make sure that you um, are keeping um, or you are using all of the last or the updated documents in the PCI Council's responsibility. It is to make sure that all of those documents are available to you in their website. If you go to the website, you go to uh, documentation, you're going to find a lot of different resources and there is guidance on almost anything regarding the payment card industry is something that I recommend you to do because it will help you a lot to understand um, the different things that we can do within the payment card industry. And finally, we are going to talk about payment brands. Our payment brands, in case of forensic investigations of data, data breaches involving cardholder data, we will have our payment brands involved in those investigations. Uh, our payment brands are going to define the fines for non-compliant entities. This is something you probably will never want to see for your organization uh, because depending on the amount of um, data that was breached, cardholder data, that might be um, the fine that they could implement or they could decide for your organization. I don't have very specific information regarding that, um, but that's the payment brand's responsibility. Next, development of compliance programs. As we already discussed before, each payment brand has its own internal compliance program and is the um, acquirer's responsibility to learn and understand those because the acquirer then will tell the merchant what to do and how to do it based on those internal compliance programs of each payment brand. Last of our list, the payment brands are going to endorse the QSA and ASB companies uh, qualification criteria. They either decide that yes, this company meets our criteria for being a, PSA, a uh, QSA company or for being an ASB company. Now, there are more responsibilities. Again, this is kind of the main ones that I can think of, but do not limit yourself to only this. There is, um, there is more out there, so feel free to do some more research. And okay, well, um, if you have seen my previous videos, my previous lessons, you noticed that I went kind of quick with this one. And the reason is because I don't want it to be a one hour 
whole lesson. Um, but I also wanted to make sure we covered the main responsibilities for each one of the different roles um, within the payment card industry. Now, there are a lot of other roles um, like qualified integrator resellers, payment application QSAs, and so many other. But regarding this training on PCI DSS version 4, these are the ones that I consider are critical for you to understand. Thank you and see you in the next video.